Hi, and welcome to the APAP podcast. My name's Corinne Young. I will be your host today. And today we are talking to Erin Cartwright. Um, she has been asked to come on this show today to talk about CPAP, CPAP compliance with patients, all the troubleshooting and problems that we have with um, CPAP. Um, and attended PA school at the University of New England. She's been a PA for almost 14 years and has worked her entire career in sleep medicine. So that's why she is our, our uh, special speaker today. Uh, she's currently working in the sleep clinic at the University of Colorado Sleep Medicine Center. She treats adult patients with all sleep disorders with a special focus on sleep apnea and positive airway pressure adherence. She enjoys the technology and the nuances of PAP machines and is regarded as the PAP guru. Uh, working in a high elevation environment presents unique challenges and opportunities for her, especially related to sleep disorder breathing and central apnea, which I know I only read about in books until I moved to this high elevation and now I see all the time. Uh, she is passionate about uh, patient education, which is probably why her patients do so well. She's uh, created many patient education programs and resources to increase awareness of sleep disorders and sleep apnea, including a large CPAP support group in the Denver area. As a PA, she's interested in the role of advanced practice providers in the field of sleep medicine. She has served on task force commissions by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine to investigate APPs working in sleep. As part of that task force, she helped create several live educational courses and online demand education uh, for clinical providers entering the field of sleep medicine. So hopefully she'll give us those resources to share with you at the end. And locally, she has served with APP leadership roles and enjoys serving as a preceptor for APP students. And besides all of that, she also is on the board of directors for the Association of Pulmonary Advanced Practice Providers. So thank you, Anne, so much for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Okay. I mean, we have to have the PAP guru if we're going to be talking about PAP therapy, right? <laughs> so um, first off, when you're starting a patient on PAP therapy, right, I'm sure you do all the education on what sleep apnea is and why they're being treated with this and how it's supposed to help them and that type of thing. But is there anything else you do that you feel is pretty fundamental for improving their success to adherence or maybe things that other providers do that may not help with them being as adherent? Yeah. So I think it's really vitally important to set the stage. Um, what happens for a lot of people is they get told, hey, you have sleep apnea, you need a CPAP. I don't know about in your area, but in my area, <clears throat> um, that often means that the machine gets shipped to them. It ends up in a box on their doorstep, and they're kind of left to their own devices to figure it out. That's probably not going to go well. So, of course, they're going to not like it and give up after a couple of days. So I really think it's important to, number one, give them realistic expectations of how it's probably going to go. Um, and number two, let them know what resources there are. So when I'm starting my patient on CPAP, I tell them, when you get it, <clears throat> Um, you're probably going to hate it. That's okay. You're not failing because they feel like they're failing you. For help. You're not failing. Um, you're not doing something wrong. That's part of the process. Asking people to wear a mask and blow air up their nose is the weirdest thing. And it's so much more than just taking a pill, right? Which we're kind of a pill society or taking an inhaler. Right. So I let them know it's okay. In fact, I expect that you're going to hate it and that's okay. Um, and giving them realistic timelines. This is going to take time. It might take four to six weeks. Um, giving them some strategies to get acclimated to it. And, um, you know, what issues do you think you're going to have that we can troubleshoot right off the bat? If you are having trouble, who do you call? When do you call me? When do you call the medical equipment provider? So really giving them the tools up front to know what to expect know that they're not alone and where to go for help so they don't give up after two or three days. I, I like that telling them you're going to hate it. That's OK. That's expected. Because I think some people may not realize that. They think, well, I hate it. I don't like this at all. Therefore, I'm not going to continue therapy because everyone else right. who does it must love it and feel so much better instantly, you know, and then yeah. um, and then they give up. So I, I do like I, I'm going to I'm going to adopt that. 
Yeah, and then they feel like if they put it on and they go right to sleep and they do great, then they're like a big winner and they're an over overachiever. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Um, low expectations, high performance, maybe. Exactly. I do that with my kids. Yeah. Um, and so for first time users, um, you know, I, I I can see that being very helpful. What do you do for patients who maybe failed in the past? And now yeah. they are returning to because they have to, because that pesky cardiologist tells them they have to. <laughs> or yes. because maybe now they're just so symptomatic they they want to, you know, do treatment, but they are already yeah. coming in with like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, I get that a lot. In fact, five times just just today. Um, so it's very, very common. <clears throat> First of all, um, I find it really helpful to educate those patients. Often um, I find that patients have not really had a thorough um, uh, description of what sleep apnea really is. Why do they have it? And really get in depth with how is it impacting your medical issues. If they're just told, hey, you really should use this, but they don't really have a lot of insight as to why it's so important, they're less likely to stick with it. So making sure they actually really understand what it's about. I see people that have been on CPAP for 15 years that still actually don't really understand why they're supposed to be using it. They just know that they are. Um, so creating that fundamental groundwork of education and knowledge. <clears throat> um, next thing I do is I talk about all options. Even if CPAP is what they should do and what they have to do, I still talk about every treatment option with every single patient. And that I you know, talk about the pros, talk about the cons, talk about this is an option. It's probably not going to work or it's not a great option for you. And here's why. And that way people are choosing CPAP. It's not being forced upon them. They are they are actually making a conscious effort to choose it and therefore more likely to be successful with it. And then third, I talk to them about why didn't you like it in the past? How did it go? And a lot of times, um, uh, just talking about the technology advances that have been made in CPAP. If they tried CPAP 15 years ago, it's a much different experience now. And I tell them, you know, your, C your cell phone's not what it was 15 years ago. Neither is CPAP. It does not mean that we're putting you on this huge, loud, clunky machine with a Darth Vader mask. Um, and so those, a lot of time, those... Um, talking points a lot of times will convince patients to be a little bit more willing to give it a try. Yeah. It, the ones that, you know, you do kind of encounter those barriers, what would you say the biggest ones are for your patients so that maybe people that are new to sleep or that are encountering a lot of patients kind of giving up, so maybe even sending equipment back before even coming to their next appointment? Um, yeah. What would you say those most common barriers are? And then maybe also what then would be a great way to pre-educate them about those barriers? Yeah. Um, so a common barrier is um, just getting used to wearing a mask. Um, you know, having something physically on their face and blowing air up the nose. And it takes time. I always introduce graded exposure. Um which means they start small and they work up to it. So I, I tell patients, you know, our goal is to get you to the point where you can sleep with your CPAP all night, every night. But we don't expect you to do that on night one. Start with putting it in your living room, put on a movie and just sit and practice with it. And if it starts to feel uncomfortable, take it off. When you're calmed down again, put it back on again. Um, so just having them start practicing with it while they are awake to get used to the sensation of the mask, the air, they're not playing with the buttons in the dark. Um, and then as they are able, slowly working up to sleeping with it. Um, so that's really helpful. The analogy I like to use is scuba diving. If you have never been scuba diving before, if you threw all the scuba gear on and jumped in the ocean, it would probably not go well. You'd feel kind of panicked. Um, so you work your way up to the ocean. Same kind of thing with the CPAP. Work your way up to using it all night. Um, so that's that's a very common barrier, just kind of getting over that initial discomfort hurdle. Um, masks. 
Um, they've again, they've come a long way. So there are so many more mask choices now than there were 10, 15 years ago. Um, often patients get fairly poor service from their medical equipment provider, or they're given one mask and not really made aware that there's others to try. So, um, you know, telling patients up front, you may have to try four or five different masks before you figure out what's going to be comfortable. So if mask you get you don't like, there's other options. That's not the only one. Um, in my area, <clears throat> um, the medical equipment providers typically give patients a 30-day mask trial period, um, but they don't always advertise that. So I tell patients that use that first month to try different masks. You're not just restricted to, you know, one or two mask choices. Being in Colorado, we're in a very dry climate. So humidification can also be a really big barrier. If their nose is dry or their mouth is dry, super uncomfortable to wear it and they're less likely to continue with therapy. Um, nowadays, machines are typically ordered with heated humidification, but most people were not told how to actually change their humidification. So it's just a matter of providing a little education. You can change your humidity. You can change your temperature setting and letting them know that that's an option. Um, nasal congestion also that's been well documented in the literature the more stuffy their nose is the harder it's going to be to use often that's because of inadequate humidification inadequate humidification so really tackling that moisture um, if that's not enough then we're usually looking at things like nasal sprays nasal lavages antihistamines or um, nasal steroid sprays depending on the situation so those are probably the most common barriers, at least at the outset, that I find. Yeah, I I, I, I think that's exactly what I see in practice also. And um, yeah, if, if they come in the office and they can't breathe through their nose before they even start therapy, you know, sometimes uh, I try to tackle that first because I know that's going to be a big issue once they, they throw that on. Yeah. Um, and some of them are so afraid to touch any of the buttons on their machine. They're afraid that they're right. going to mess up their settings. And I try to tell them it's patient proof. You really can't mess it up. But, you know, it's meant for you to be fumbling around in the dark, pressing all sorts of buttons. You can't you really can't mess it up. So uh -huh. kind of encouraging them to uh, be proactive with their device. And then also I'll say just bring the whole machine in and we can do some yes. education with you on it, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, some patients, unfortunately, are told by the respiratory therapist that set up, it's all set for you, don't touch anything, which I hate it when they do that because patients yeah. are so afraid. Um, we also, at our clinic, we tell patients, bring all of your equipment every single time um, so we can troubleshoot, we can show you things, we can actually mm -hmm. see what's going on um, in real time. That's a really good the, idea. Yeah. yeah. I don't tell them to bring it every single time, but sometimes they'll do it on their own or during a visit. I find out they're struggling with something. So I say next visit, bring it in or just come in yeah. for yeah. Uh, working with our RT or something. But that's that's pretty mm -hmm. smart to do. Utilizing on that topic, too, um, if you're not already or not aware, um, the machines nowadays, the Philips devices and the ResMed, which are the most common machines used in the United States, there are patient apps and websites that are extremely helpful. Yes. Um, so the patient can create an account, uh, type in their serial number, and they get all their data, they get coaching, they get feedback, and there's a whole library of information, everything from what is sleep apnea to I forgot what my provider said. How do I change my humidifier? Uh -huh. um, so there's a lot of resources right there. So you don't necessarily have to spend time doing that in clinic because um, I know we all have a ton of time to do those things. But just getting people those resources and knowing where to turn is really helpful. I, I really like that over the last couple of years now with the serial number, you can go to the website, enter it in, and I can manipulate their settings yes. right there at the visit. Uh -huh. And I tell them that ahead of time. If you're really struggling with the uh, pressure, you know, with, with that type of thing, call me or, you know, come in and I can do it right then. We don't have to hack into your machine or, you know, we don't have to do all this. Send, wait, send an order to the DME, wait for them to contact you, wait to yeah. see if it gets done. 
so I, I, I've had a couple patients say, oh, that makes me feel so much better that you can change it instantly if I call. Yes. Yeah. Just call or we'll try something else. Say, try it over the weekend. Try it for a few days. Just let's just see. Right. Um, yeah. And, and if you're not you doing CPAP or sleep therapy a lot, um, you can pretty much change anything and everything remotely. So even if you have a patient that lives really far away or it's hard for them to get to the clinic, you can change their pressure settings, their ramp, their flex or the EPR settings. In most cases, it's a little bit machine dependent. You can change their humidity and temperature for them. So it's very, very easy to make simple changes. So let's talk a little bit about complications of pap therapy outside the dry mouth. It kind of impacts their compliance and adherence. Um, one being claustrophobia uh-huh. and sometimes that's just the mass, but sometimes it's the pressure, you know, and that uh-huh. reflex to uh-huh. hold their breath. Um, and then the other being gastric inflation. So I'd love your opinion on when you hear this from patients, what is your go-to or what's your algorithm that you use to help those patients? Yeah. So when patients say the word claustrophobia, I do a little bit more digging. I find that true claustrophobia where they are literally feeling anxious because they feel like they're being smothered or having something on their face. I find that that is actually pretty rare. It's more often they're just not comfortable with it or the air pressure is not right and kind of their go to the way they describe it is, I can't stand it, I'm claustrophobic. So just asking a lot more questions like, what does it feel like when you put the mask on? How long does it take before you start to feel like this? What are you actually feeling? Do you feel like you can breathe? Do you feel like your breath's being sucked out of you? Do you feel like it's hard to breathe in? Do you feel like it's hard to breathe out? What happens when you take the mask off? So just trying to ask more questions and get the patients to describe a little bit more about what is going on. Usually it's not claustrophobia. Um, so Sometimes it is. And I find that true true claustrophobia... Um, some patients know they have to say, oh, if I get an MRI machine, like that's it, it's over, like the thought of putting the mask. Those patients, sometimes they will just look at their mask and start having anxiety. Um, <clears throat> so it does happen. I do find that claustrophobia and those extreme anxious feelings tend to be more common in um, uh, women, unfortunately, that have been victims of domestic violence. A lot of times they have been strangled or smothered with pillows. Um, Also, this sounds silly, but people that have grown up with brothers, I don't know, they always say brothers smothered them with their pillows and they have a harder time with that feeling of, oh my God, I can't breathe, something's covering my face. Um, People that have had near drowning experiences Um, and people that have really severe uh, pulmonary issues and are very worried about their ability to breathe. That's when we tend to see more of the true claustrophobia. Um, What we do about it, graded exposure. Typically, those patients have to go slower. My worst claustrophobic patient, she could literally only tolerate wearing the mask for 10 seconds, and that was it. Full-blown anxiety attack. It took about six months, and now she wears it all the time. And she does great. It takes time. So it takes willingness on the patient to stick with it, kind of fight through that discomfort. Um, So we go very, very, very slow. Um, That's a situation when I would um, refer them to my sleep psychologists. Um, So the same sleep psychologists that are going to do your, you know, CBTI and insomnia therapy, also very, very good at helping Um, claustrophobia and significant anxiety around using CPAP. And I've never had a patient go wrong working with them. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what about gastric inflation? Gastric inflation. So first of all, I think it's something that's important to ask about. Um, So what happens, we call it aerophagia, which literally means swallowing air. Some of the air, instead of going into their lungs, goes down the wrong tube and gets into their stomach. It can make patients very gassy, and it can come out either end. So they can be belching a lot in the morning. They can be passing gas in the morning. Sometimes they have significant distension and bloating that can be quite uncomfortable and painful. Um, And sometimes it can be pretty profound. I have um, one patient, 
um, she would get uh, two patients come to mind. One, she would get up two hours, uh, set her alarm for two hours before she had to get up to work, take the mask off so she had time to pass all of her gas before she had to get up to go to work so she wasn't gassy at work. So her last two hours of sleep were no CPAP. Um, and then I had another patient. She was so bloated from her CPAP in the morning. She would buy uh, bigger pants. She would put those on. And then after a couple of hours when the gas was on, then she could put on her regular pants for the day. So sometimes it can be very dramatic and uncomfortable. Um, it's important to ask about because patients won't always make the connection, oh, I'm gassy, especially if it's passing gas. They won't necessarily think of their CPAP. Um, so, uh, the solution is to, uh, maximize their pressure release features. Um, so most of the CPAP machines have some kind of pressure relief. It's called different things depending on their machine where the machine sinks with the patient's breathing. And when they exhale, it drops the pressure. And by dropping that pressure with exhalation, often we can get that um, aerophasia or gastric inflation to go away. If not, my next step is bi-level. Uh -huh. And almost always by switching to a bi-level device, it, it goes away. What? So could you give people examples, you know, again, if you're not very familiar with uh -huh. your CPAP patient, CPAP machine. So what are some examples before going to bi-level that you would see options, you know, on, on your on the devices, yeah. On devices. So if it's a Philips Respironics device, the pressure relief is going to be called flex. Um, and it's level one, two, and three. The higher the number, the more the pressure is going to decrease with exhalation. It's arbitrary. So one drops it a little bit, two is a little bit more, three is a little bit more. Um, the patient actually has complete control over turning that on or off or setting the level. On ResMed devices, which are more common now because of the recall, um, it's called EPR, which is expiratory pressure relief. Again, it's level one, two, or three, but the number actually corresponds with the pressure drop. So okay. if their EPR is on level two and they are on CPAP at 10, that means it's, it's almost like a mini bi-level. When they inhale, it's 10, but when they exhale, it's dropping to eight. Um, on the ResMed devices, the patient can turn it. Oh, no, I'm going to get confused on the spot. I think the patients can turn it on or off, but they can't set the level or, okay. or it's flipped. Or they can set the level, but they can't turn it on or off. One of those. They don't have complete control over it like they do on the, the ResMed devices. So Fair. it is a more substantial pressure drop on ResMed compared to the Philips Respironics devices. Okay. Okay. Yep, that's good to know because I know uh, for a while there I was seeing um, uh, providers in my practice who were, you know, if that was happening, they were just going straight to bi-level pressure, um, mm -hmm. which I don't yeah. know if is necessarily wrong, but, you know, just not knowing yeah, as technology is changing with these yeah. devices that there is that option on there. It's not wrong. It just may not be needed. Right. Oh, one other tidbit on ResMed with EPR, you, if it's on, it could be on all the time. There's also an option to only turn it on during the ramp. So at the beginning, it's on, but then it's off the rest of the night. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. So the more um, difficult patients, the ones with insomnia. Wow. So, okay. you know, CPAP initially does not, for everyone, improve their quality of sleep. It tends to uh, worsen their quality of sleep initially. <laughs> uh -huh. And for patients with insomnia, they are definitely more likely to struggle. Yeah. Uh, so what are you doing with your patients with a known history of insomnia coming in to see you that, you know, and maybe start with patients with insomnia that you know is controlled and those ones that are not controlled? Yeah. Um, so I, as part of kind of the laying out expectations ahead of time, I do tell them, you know, this may cause more sleep disruption at first so that that's not, doesn't cause them to abandon therapy. Um but a lot of people, if you can get them over the first couple of weeks, particularly if they have poorly controlled insomnia, a lot of times it does get better. Um, now, it will depend a little bit if they have more sleep onset insomnia compared to sleep maintenance insomnia. Sleep onset insomnia, where they just really have a hard time initiating sleep, they can't get their mind to shut off. 
That's not usually going to always get better. Sometimes. Not as often, though, with using CPAP compared to sleep maintenance insomnia. Often when they wake up and they're having a hard time getting back to sleep, it's because of their sleep apnea that's waking them up and they just have so that sympathetic surge and adrenaline going through their system. It's just hard to sleep. Um, So it will depend a little bit on what what type of insomnia they have. Um, But I, I tell people... Try it out. If it's not going well and you're really struggling, sometimes I will do a sleeping pill, um, something that does not cause respiratory depression. I try not to use a benzo. Uh-huh. Um, something like Ambien, Lunesta, Trazodone, um, just to kind of help get them to sleep a little bit better and kind of sleep through that discomfort um, can be really helpful. And they don't typically need it long term, often just a, f- a few weeks, maybe a month or two. Um, and then if they're acclimated to CPAP and their insomnia is not better, then we're getting into the whole insomnia world of do they need to be on long term medications, insomnia therapy, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. We're very lucky to have an insomnia clinic down here with a cognitive yeah. behavioral specialist and all that. Always really helpful for those very patients. Very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, like you said before, setting those expectations of this is not normal to do to strap something to your face and it's uh-huh. likely going to, it just, again, it's likely to go bad and that's okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. So, last question I have for you is. When do you abandon PAP therapy? When do you finally say, let's move on to something else? Yeah. Um, It it depends on the patient. I mean, some of it is is when the patients are ready. Some patients, you know, I'm like, do you want to talk about other options? And sometimes like, no, you know, I still want to keep trying. I still want to keep trying. So some of it is really up to the patient. But in general, you know, if it's been three to six months and they just cannot get comfortable with it. They really cannot sleep with it, even with a sleep sleep aid. Um, If they're feeling like it's just causing more sleep disruption, they sleep worse with it. Um, And we've kind of tried all the tricks. Um, Then, you know, we'll start looking at a, a potential other option. Okay. All right. Well, could you share some of the resources you mentioned or I mentioned about you a little earlier, uh, maybe some great resources for patients and then some resources uh-huh. for those looking to improve their sleep medicine skills or those that are coming in new to sleep medicine? Yeah. So for patients, I um, already mentioned the, the um, machine apps and websites. Um, there's a list of really good websites that I give to patients. Um, I like the AASM, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine website. It's sleepeducation.org, um, and it's geared towards patients. Lots of very helpful information. The American, excuse me, the American Sleep Apnea Association is helpful. The National Sleep Foundation is helpful. Um, and then the ASM, not specific to sleep apnea, but sleep in general, they have kind of a new uh, wellness sleep campaign, and their website is called uh, sleepisgoodmedicine.com. So just general information about why sleep is important and what can happen if you don't get enough sleep. Um, So those are really good resources as well. Um, If there are CPAP support groups in your area, that is always a helpful resource, or you can create your own. The other thing, it's through the American Acad- um, sorry, the American Sleep Apnea Association. They have a peer mentor program, oh. where um, if you if your patient is struggling, they can sign up to get paired with a fellow CPAP user. Um, so they're it, it's not just their doctor telling them what to do, <laughs> but they're actually getting that commissary, if you will, with yes. a fellow user. On the flip side, if you have a patient that is doing well, they love their CPAP, especially if they struggled and now they are just gung-ho about it, you might talk to them about being a mentee and actually coaching and mentoring other people. They do get trained. They don't just, like, let them talk to people. So they do get trained in some resources. Um, But those are all good good resources for for patients. On the provider side... um, All of the big uh, societies have really helpful information on their websites. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine and CHEST are the two that I find most helpful. Um, 
provider information and patient information, patient handouts that you can use as well. Um, some of the stuff I was involved in through the AASM, it's at the time, it was before we were kind of called APPs, it was the APRN um, modules. And so it's 15 hours or so of online on-demand content. It's geared towards people that are kind of newly going into sleep. So it's a good foundation of about sleep. A lot about sleep apnea, but also other sleep disorders as well, like insomnia and narcolepsy. Well, that's 15 hours of free education. That's pretty awesome. It's not, for, it's not free. You don't oh, have to pay sorry. I for it. No, free. it's not. Free. No, they do make you pay for it. Um, it's not bad, though. There is another webinar that got released, and I'm not sure the name of it, it but it's about um, tr uh, improving CPAP adherence more from the psychological perspective, not like physical, let's deal with your mask, um, but more <laughs> the psychological background. Um, I believe that one is free, and that is wonderful as well. I, it's, it's, I think 90% of the problem is the, the psychological piece of it. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad you Welcome. joined us and shared all that information. I know everyone listening is uh, going to take that back to their practice. And um, please let us know if uh, we can have you back. Maybe we'll talk about central apnea next time. Always happy to have you. Oh, happy to have you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone listening. Bye.